He is a staunch advocate for accessible quality education. As chairman and CEO of diversified conglomerate Finma Corporation, his education unit is on an acquisition spree, aiming to create opportunities for graduates, their families, and communities. He served as the Philippine Finance Secretary and chaired the National Museum of the Philippines. With us now on Thought Leaders, please welcome the chairman of the Philippine Business for Education, Ramon Del Rosario, Jr. Good to have you with us, Ramon. Good Welcome. to be here. Thank you very much for asking me. Very good to see you again. The first time I met you, and I'm sure you remember this a ways back, really a long way back, I met you as the finance minister oh, of the Philippines. So that was, was when I was a cover That's a very reporter. small blip in my life. <laughs> <laughs> that did not last very long, as you know. But it did make an impression on me because right. as I followed your career, mm -hmm. uh, you went into education and full on with FINMA, then Philippine Business later, for yeah. Education, much later. I was first and in the financial world. Yeah. National Museum of the Philippines. Oh, sheesh. Okay. Sheesh. <laughs> <laughs> That's loaded. Yeah. But you got to tell me, where do the lines crisscross between, say, a, a government um, posting that deals with the country's finances okay. and national pursuits like education, history, arts, and culture. Well, let me tell you, um, from from uh, from the finance, uh, from finance, I went back to my first love at the time was finance. So investment banking and then commercial banking. Uh, I was invited by the Soriano Group to start and score finance, it started out that way. And then eventually we grew it into a savings bank, into a commercial bank, into a universal bank. That became Asian Bank. That was my first baby for the longest time. I was not involved with the FINMA group at all. Um, I only got involved uh, with the FINMA group through the board, through the boards of the companies, because my father, of course, was the principal shareholder even then. Um, the reason we got into education was because of the Asian financial crisis. Mm. As you may recall... 97, 98. Yes, FINMA mm. was very large in the cement industry. When FINMA was founded, it was from the start with the idea that business should participate in nation building. My, father, my father's background at the time was that he had worked for IBM and then was at Philam Life. So he was working for foreign bosses. So there were two objectives in forming FINMA. One is to participate in nation building, but the second was to prove that Filipino managers can manage enterprises at least as well as or even better than foreign managers. So he was motivated by these lofty, lofty ideas. And the first venture they went into was one of the earliest privatizations in the Philippines, cement. Uh, a small plant in Bacnotan, La Union, became Bacnotan Consolidated Industries eventually. So long story short, um, FINMA got started in cement and it grew. It was very successful. And at the point when we divested, we had 50% of the total Philippine production of cement. But the Asian financial crisis hit us really hard because we were on the verge of expanding very boldly. You remember those were the Ramos years, and mm -hmm. the Ramos years was full of exuberance. Uh, and people thought that life was going to go on, on, a, on a straight path upward. We were the tiger cubs of Asia, etc. So many groups, and we were not alone, were expanding their businesses and expanding with, with foreign currency loans. Uh, we were expanding two of our cement plants at the same time. We were expanding our pulp and paper company. And I think that we had a small a steel plant making uh, uh, those rods, uh, mm -hmm. reinforced bars. All of those projects were financed with uh, foreign loans. Uh, when the crisis came, it hit our businesses very hard. Interest because rates, construction it, stopped, all correct, the building stopped. Correct. This was construction the was among the hardest hit. Correct. And that's where property. cement depends for its, for and, its and demand. And you were fully invested. In, in cement so and it in was a, I don't know, double, triple whammy. Wow. The demand for cement dropped really like crazy. But in the meantime, there we were expanding our cement plants very aggressively using foreign currency loans, which in peso terms doubled overnight. 
With How no, did you survive? With no increase oh, in capacity. I mean, when, well, when did you get into yeah. education? Did you use that well, as a means of actually sustaining or pivoting away? We survived from by selling off part of the business first. Fortunately, that was a time when the major cement companies of the world were interested in the Philippines. So all of them were interested. They called on us and said they were interested, etc. We ended up sold, selling to Holcim, used to be called Holder Bank. At first, we sold 50%, and then we eventually said, you know, this business has changed, etc. Maybe we should just get, get out of the business. That's when we had to decide what to do next. And what to do next, again, was guided by this old guiding principle of ours. What do we do to help build the Philippines into a stronger, better nation? And the thought process was, what's our principal resource? Our principal resource is our people. So we said, if our principal resources are people, then we really need to provide them good quality education so that they will be armed properly to do their share in the economy. Was both that in from the Philippines dad, and from to be competitive Ramon Del Rosario Sr., that, that grain he, of an idea? He was still here, but I would have to say that I was the principal promoter of the idea already at that point. Yeah, My dad was on the verge of retiring. Uh, and I was the principal proponent of the idea of going to education. The background is we had served in educational institutions, either as members of board of trustees or even as chairman of board of trustees. I was at De La Salle. My, uh, my chairman, Oscar Yelado, was at La Salle uh, Bacolod. Mark Albarazin, our vice chairman, was dean of the Graduate School of Business in UP. So there was a little bit, we thought we knew what education was all about. Did so you? we said, let's I mean, do it. <laughs> well, what did you learn then? I mean, well, looking back. So we said, let's do it. And everybody agreed, hey, that sounds like a noble idea and it sounds like it should be fun. And we were looking at the likes of Jose Rizal University at the time, Mapua University. And they looked like they were making reasonable returns on their investments. So we said, we think we can do something. But we decided that we wanted to do education for the poor. We wanted it to be focused on the underserved sectors good quality education for the underserved sectors. And good quality education we defined early on, it's not education that's research oriented or going to produce Nobel Prize winners. It's designed to prepare the kids for jobs. That's what it's all about. And it starts with top notchers. Uh, I see not that yet, you have not yet, already not yet. <laughs> uh, produced several top notchers in different well, fields. Well, you're going for, ahead of the story. But <laughs> for the schools that you've purchased, um, and you have well went ahead with your own narrative because you started purchasing schools. We started by purchasing schools. Uh, the schools, the, typically the schools that we encountered had been founded three generations ago by people who were really interested in, in running schools running good schools. The second generation grew the schools and the third generation was milking the schools and getting what they could out of the schools. So the schools typically had had better days and were now floundering and not doing very well. But we thought that that would be the good entry point. So we ended up first in Cabanatuan, Araulio University, and then in Cagayan de Oro, Cagayan de Oro College. Uh, the reason why we did not enter Metro Manila to start with was we did not want to use up our resources in buying real estate because the, the schools here are, are you know, located in areas where the real estate is very expensive. We really wanted to buy the educational institution rather than the real estate. Of course, we had to do that as well. Uh, we thought that we put the FINMA name. We say FINMA is well known in the business community. We throw around a few computers, paint the buildings nicely, etc. And people would say, ah, okay, new owners, they will come. They didn't. <laughs> it wasn't as simple as that, I guess uh, is what I'm saying. It wasn't as simple as that. They required, I guess it took a while for us to find out what it would take. And it really took building up the reputation of our schools slowly, slowly. And in the first, uh, the first instance, it took a runway of about five, six, seven years before they generated reasonable profits. Fortunately for us, the schools were reasonably profitable from the very beginning because we, we immediately saw things we could do. We could uh, bring in new faculty. We could uh, introduce some business-oriented practices that would make it more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. Such and as? Could you, could you well, cite that? For because example, it's, it's really been a big challenge. From the, from the very, very beginning, beginning we said it's really we shortage would, of staff, would, yeah. shortage of, of resources, equipment. Yeah. From the very beginning, for example, the first two schools, we said we would only have one set of corporate officers for the two schools. And now even with nine schools, we still have just one set of corporate officers 
one CEO, one chief learning officer, one chief marketing officer, one chief financial officer. So we're not building up the corporate overhead. And then we're doing things in common. Uh, the, the teaching modules, the training programs for the teachers, that kind of thing. It's being shared throughout the network. But of so the nine schools, you've yeah. got one in Indonesia. So I'm wondering what the strategy is because it's already a lot to, to take care of when yeah. you think of the Philippine and, educational and we're by no system, means, we're taking by care no of means, eight schools. We're by no means overlooking the Philippines. There's still so much to be done here. What happened was several things. We took in some investors. Uh, among the investors was the Asian Development Bank, an FMO, the Dutch Development Finance Organization, and a group called Kaizen, Kaizen Vest, which is a Singapore-based uh, fund uh, focused on education. And all of them said that our model was a fantastically successful because by the time we had shown a good track record of growing our schools. We, from, from the first two, we doubled to, to another two, which was in Pagasinan and in Iloilo. And then we built in some more, some more. And the enrollment just kept, kept growing. And the success was based on our track record in, in the board exams. One of the things that kids and their parents follow is employability. And employability is to a large extent dependent on the ability of these kids to do well in the board exams that they have to take. Almost all, so many careers in the Philippines um, are subject to, to board exams that they have to take. And so we, we paid particular attention to that. And that once it became known that FINMA schools were producing kids that were doing well, in these licensure exams, I guess word got around and enrollment started growing. And that was the pathway that we used. And our investors said to us, and we ourselves were saying to ourselves, maybe this model does not have to be limited to the Philippines. Maybe there are other markets where where this this will also work. I want to point out, by the way, that the challenge was more pronounced than one would think because the kids applying to our schools were really not qualified to enter college. Their competencies in terms of math, reading, and science were at about the grade, grade four or grade five level. So if you administer the normal admission tests for, for, for freshmen, they would all, 97% of them would not qualify. Only 3% would. But you turn them away and they are, they are destined to be poor for the rest of their lives. So we said to ourselves, if we're going to try to pursue this mission of making lives better through education, we take in these kids and work with them so that at the end of their four or five years with us, they will be in a position to, sit, to take the same board exams that the guys from UP, La Sala, Teneo, et cetera, are taking and have a good chance of passing them. That's the challenge we we put ourselves to. Let me pick up on what you said about employability because this is really important with uh, the the statistics that we have when it comes to underemployment. We're still looking at double digit unemployment that also relates to job mismatching and and really the challenge of trying to find a job for every student who graduates. What kind of solutions are you finding? would resolve this this perennial problem of a job mismatch when we're talking about the age of AI displacing yeah, well, jobs. Yeah. Well, first of all, we focus on, on the courses that are in demand. Uh, and the kids are very good at, at determining that for themselves. Um, so our most popular courses are things like nursing, education, accountancy, and business, and a course called criminology. You know, this was a surprise to many of us that criminology exists <laughs> and that it is a popular course. But apparently in a lot of these rural communities, the kids don't have too many role models to look up to as a way towards a better life. And the policeman in the community is looked upon as a, as a figure who, will, uh, who, who has, I guess, status in society and that's what they aspire for. So, so many of our kids, as many as 25% of our kids across our network is enrolled in criminology. So what are we doing in criminology? Of course, we're trying our best to train the kids to become good, honest, ethical, moral, <laughs> morally strong policemen. Because we, th- we told ourselves, if they're going to be policemen, uh, this will be a huge responsibility for us. And if we are able to improve the quality of our policemen by introducing these ethical qualities in them, we will have contributed something to society. So 
it's it's really arming them with the skills and competencies that they need to be able to not only get the jobs but hold on to them that's the key to the whole thing and i guess through the years we've had to learn as we as we've proceeded but i guess the the record is pretty good before the pandemic um, within one year of graduation 80 percent of our kids were employed in some form or another i'm not saying necessarily in what they in the course they took but were employed in some form or another through the pandemic, that number dropped a bit, and now we're at about 71%, and we're trying to bring that up again. But in terms of our board passing rates across our schools, our passing rate is 79%. In the very first school that we bought, I like telling this story, uh, in the year before uh, we bought them, their passing rate in the accountancy board exams was zero. All the kids from that school who took the board exam failed. Now we're having some board exams where we have uh, top notchers, as you mentioned earlier. We're very pleased with our record. As I said, 79% across the board are top notchers in, uh, in optometry and in dentistry recently. Southwestern University had, I guess we're now number one. In criminology, we're number one and number two. Cagayan de Oro College and Arroyo University have very high ratings in criminology. And across the board, uh, we, we have had good success in in the, medi in the medicine exams, uh, accountancy, engineering. So we work with our kids, work very hard, but it takes a lot of diligent attention. And it's really, a lot of it is hand-holding. So what more can we see from FINMA? You're into an acquisition spree and it's not stopping anytime soon. Well, and where will you in, be? In education, uh, we are moving towards uh, going out of the Philippines which is not to say we will ignore the Philippines. There's so much more to be done here. And we're still gung-ho about the Philippines. And we expect that our growth in the Philippines will continue to be very strong. But we did have an opportunity to go into Indonesia. We acquired a small um, uh, nursing and uh, business school in a town called Kerawa, which is outside of Jakarta. Started it because we like the licenses that they have. And we said, we will apply the same things that we're doing here. Yeah. Again, catering to the underserved sector. That has begin, began to grow. And just last few months, this year, uh, a few months ago, we were able to grow it to a point where we now have university status in Indonesia. Uh, and we have acquired another school uh, through a management agreement to start with in, the, in, in Jakarta itself. So we have very high hopes. We have very high hopes for Indonesia. Well, Indonesia to start with is about twice as large as the Philippines. And they too have a problem of um, good quality education for the underserved sectors. So we're thinking that Indonesia might even be larger than the Philippines over time, depending on how successful we can be. Might we find you in Metro Manila soon? We are in Metro Manila now. We have two little schools. Not so little anymore, actually. The two together are already 10,000 students. And we started with a school, a small school called St. Jude, not the, not the famous St. Jude near Malacanang. That's a high school. This is St. Jude uh, in the Sampaloc area. And then a small college in Cubao called Republican College. Uh, and those two schools will be the, 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 the basis for growing, growing our Metro Manila schools. And I said the two combined already have 10,000 students now. And then in Laguna, we're doing the same thing. We acquired two small schools, one in uh, Santa Cruz and one in uh, Calamba. And we're growing from almost nothing and they're beginning to grow and they're showing great promise. We're looking at the uh, cities where there's good growth, uh, where there's a lot of kids that are underserved and where there's good employment opportunities who, who, who can be, uh, which can be exploited by kids that are be better prepared. We're also doing quite a bit in terms of linking up our kids with, with businesses. That's one of the, one of the uh, solutions to getting, getting them employed. Uh, in all of our schools, our um, deans and our faculty members have added as one of their missions to link up with the local business community and find out from them what are the skills that that's, that's, well, first, what's their experience in dealing with our graduates? What are the pluses and what are the minuses? And what are the things we can do better? What more can we do so that our kids are better equipped to work in their companies? And then if there are special training programs that they'd like us 
to enter into, we're, we're very willing. We're very willing to talk in those terms and hopefully improve the pathway towards employment in their companies. So that kind of thing. That's the advantage of a, of a system of schools that's linked up with a business organization like us. We have our network in the business community and we bring that together with our schools and that's one of the formulas for success. Let me the challenge take, take is that the, hand holding yeah. into context because uh, we're coming from the pandemic and I, I yeah. wondered, you, you were mentioning about profitability as if the pandemic didn't happen, but what exactly did you do as a school system to ensure that the kids got to continue to learn despite one of the longest lockdowns in the world? In the pandemic, we continued a system that we were already using in our schools. In our schools, we have decided and we have learned through the years that the old style of uh, having kids listen to teachers lecturing them every day and, and then passively listening to them throughout one hour is not the way for kids to learn. There is this method introduced by a couple called the Berdidos, yes. the Ramon Magsaysay ORDs, in fact, which we've adopted uh, not only in grade school, but in high school and even in the first years of college. Basically what it is, it is interactive learning. You learn by doing, by working on your worksheets, etc. So on a daily basis, we have worksheets that they work on depending on the course content and what they're supposed to learn for that period. The teacher lectures them for about 20 minutes and then for the rest of the hour, they, they work on their worksheets. And at the end, the teacher uh, or the teacher's aide checks to see what they did and what they did right and what they did wrong and go through it. But that process and they can interact with each other during that period. That does several things. It, it makes it so that our teachers are able to handle three classes in one hour, 20 minutes here, and then they move to the next class. A teacher's aide then stays and move to the next and then to the next. So in one hour, you have three 20 minute sessions. So a teacher is able to handle what? 120 students, 150 students. Uh, that makes it more efficient, but it does. It is at no sacrifice to learning whatsoever. We have, we have tested to see the results and we are very pleased to say that the results are in fact, to some extent, even better than the old style of keeping teachers really stuck uh, with a class. So hybrid learning hour. is here to stay? Is that what you're... And that's the method we used to respond to the pandemic. Whereas other schools had to scramble to figure out how to teach the kids because they were not geared and that way. And you're finding that that is the way to go? And we are continuing the way to go. Is to continue yeah. we hybrid never went learning. Into, we never went into, what, what do you call, um, um, online, online teaching because almost well, so many of our kids do not have access to the internet, quite honestly. Many of them did not even have cell phones. In fact, in the early part, we had to provide cell phones, but the cell phones are not for delivering education. It's for allowing them to communicate with their teachers regularly from time to time. We set aside certain days of the, of the week and certain periods when they could communicate with their teachers and also when they could communicate with each other. And that turned out to be a, a very successful model. But the other thing we did was we um, went out of our way to make ourselves present uh, in the community, including in the homes of some of our kids. If we noticed that some of our kids were, were um, sort of not attending classes regularly, for example, a teacher would visit them, uh, would first ask what's, what's going on and would teach, would visit them in their homes and find out what can we do for you? Is there a particular problem? If it's financial, can we address it by extending the payment terms or giving you more scholarship, that kind of thing. Or if it's a learning problem, if it's an issue with uh, ability to keep up with the lessons, maybe we can give them remedial courses, etc. Now that kind of attention um, became known in the community. And we think one of the reasons why our enrollment grew in the two main years of the pandemic by 30% each year, when so many other schools were losing their enrollment, and we think one of the main reasons for that was because it had gone around that Finma schools really care for their students and are really interested in their kids' learning. And this is manifested by the personal attention that the teachers and the school administrators really pay. And even fellow students sometimes pay calls on the people. So it's that kind of a nurturing, supporting, supporting environment that we try to create. You know, one of the challenges for kids, particularly from rural communities when they go to school, particularly big schools, is number one, 
their self-esteem is not very high. They think that they are uh, not qualified to complete their studies. They have very low self-confidence. Uh, so one of the things we do is reinforce their self-confidence and tell them you can do it. And one of the things we like to do is show them role models of kids who started out from their own uh, social class and show them how it can be done. And there are role models of that kind of thing. So that kind of thing went on and on and on. And we continue doing that now. And that's one of the secrets, I guess, of our success. This whole nurturing environment that we've created uh, has become uh, a hallmark, I guess, of our schools. Let's talk about that backdrop that you're working with. Uh, things probably you cannot uh, take control of, like say the K to 12 curriculum. I yeah. mean, we've been at it for 11 years and there's been an assessment, a reassessment of whether this really benefits yeah. the kids because there are academics who blame the K-12 curriculum for the job mismatches. Um, Do you agree? <laughs> no. Um, the basic problem with Philippine education starts with the basics. The kids don't learn to read and write and that's not the problem of adding two years. It's really from the very beginning and it starts even before they go to school, nutrition. Malnutrition, this issue of stunting is not, is not a small thing. Up to 30% of our kids have brains that do not develop properly because the kids do not have the right kind of nutrition in their, in their infancy. And when you start with that as, a, as an issue, that carries forward as you move on. So you need to address basic things like nutrition from the time the mothers are pregnant to the first 1,000 days, there is a saying that if the brain's underdeveloped in those first 1,000 days, you can no longer remediate. You cannot do anything about it anymore. Um, that will forever be a handicap. Of course, you can do things to help them learn, etc., as much as you can, but that, that handicap will remain pretty much for life. So it's really, really, really urgently important that that be addressed. And then this Would you whole, be getting into that space then? Well, into through addressing Philippine business, stunting? Well, through Philippine Business for Education. We, do, we, do, we are very active in Philippine Business for Education. I was the founding chairman and Chito Salazar is the founding president. And we continue to be very active there. And I'm very pleased to say that the CEOs whom we invited to participate in Philippine Business for Education continue to be very actively involved. And that's why the organization has gained in credibility and it's an organization that's now able to put forward its thoughts and its, uh, and its recommendations with some degree of credibility. So we have, we have members of Congress listening to us, uh, the D Department of Education listening to us, uh, and we're able to influence some of the legislation that, that comes out. The Education Commission that is now doing its work was one of the advocacies of Philippine Business for Education. <coughs> In fact, K-12 was one of our initial advocacies as well. When Brother Armin uh, became Education Secretary, he pursued that very, very aggressively, as you know. Well, Brother Armin was one of the early advisors of Philippine Business for Education, as was Tati Liguanan. So we had it covered on, on both sides, um, both basic education and So are you still education. hanging on to K-12 curriculum? I agree it needs to be improved. I agree its implementation was not as good as it should have been. But I think, I think the idea of reverting back to 10 years rather than 12 is a major step backward. Why First is that? of all, the rest of the world, ha there is consensus among education experts that you do need 12 years uh, to reach uh, the college, college level, both in terms of the content that you have to absorb, but also in terms of the level of your maturity so that you, go, you get on. And, and there are very significant efforts through PBED and various efforts to improve the employability of the kids coming out of senior high school now. Uh, we have been very active through PBED in, uh, and, and with the support of groups like the Australian uh, government and USA, USAID in uh, what we call workforce development efforts, uh, teaming up with companies like Jollibee and others, uh, trying to figure out what are the key, well, SAPI and these um, uh, IT organizations are very active here pinpointing the specific competencies that the kids need to get more of, and then trying to enhance the content, and also getting involved in the curriculum uh, that the kids go through. Looking this, back, what would have been the better way to implement K-12 curriculum? 
Well, having that as hindsight. Well, uh, there there are issues from very basic things like you know that one of the issues is this whole idea of um, mother tongue based instruction at the earliest years and that is very crucial for kids to understand and to learn how to read and write uh, because of course if they do not understand what is being communicated to them then they will not learn uh, so it starts with that and we were not very well prepared to implement this mother tongue mother tongue instruction because I guess there was too much of an effort to fine-tune it to too many too many dialects and too many courses. Perhaps the better way would have been to, to, to say there are, say, 10 major dialects uh, throughout the Philippines, and you choose which is the most appropriate for the region. But don't, lit don't say literally whatever is spoken in the household is what you have to teach them in, because some people were beginning to... <laughs> I guess look at that quite literally. So the idea of moving, uh, increasing the, the basic education uh, period to 12 years, part of it was to decongest the learning experience because there were too many things that were being thrown into the, to the kids that they, they were having difficulty learning the basic things well. And the idea was to focus on the basics. But when the two extra years were added, there is this um, penchant to keep throwing additional things that the kids, that people think the kids should learn. Uh, all kinds of things came into the picture again. So again, it's, it's, it's congested. And that's why I think the appropriate thing is to have this education commission look at this whole system in a holistic manner and come up with an integrated solution to all of the problems of our education system. For example, our education system is what's called trifocalized. You've got basic education under DepEd, higher education under CHED, and then the, uh, uh, the, the TechVoc uh, under TESDA. And the three of them are supposed to talk to each other and coordinate, but it's very difficult because they have their own silos. And historically, uh, they do not communicate and coordinate with each other. So one of the challenges, I think, of the Education Commission is to figure out. On the other hand, the education community worldwide, I understand, is not unified in terms of whether they think a unified um, system of governance for education is better than this segmented well, what do you thing. Think? Do you agree with that? I tend to think that maybe maybe um, uh, high, grade school and high school should be one, and college and the college level should be one, and perhaps the tech box should be part of the higher education so that they're better blended, because some of them want to take um, professional courses but some of them want to take things like liberal arts, et cetera, and, and, and make that better coordinate. Maybe those two can, be, but still there has to be a coordinating mechanism. And so one of the secretaries has to be clearly designated as the boss of education. Um, I think that would, that would make sense, but it's up really to the Education Commission to come up with, with their solution. Let's talk about higher education institution learning because there's a lot to say about giving kids representation. And that's the reason why we had the free tuition law in 2017 in the hope that there would be more kids who would benefit from subsidized tuition fees. Mm. But looking in hindsight, do you think that that had been achieved? Because there are academics who say that it really wasn't for the poor. It turned out to be um, free tuition law for the rich. That is a valid issue. Um, in universities, of course, classic examples of the University of the Philippines, they say the main problem with UP is looking for enough parking space for all the cars of all the kids uh, because it's really not a university for the poor. When you impose entrance exams the way they do, almost automatically you exclude a lot of the poor kids who are just not equipped to handle that kind of entrance exam. So that's a dilemma. On the other hand, UP, I guess, has a rightful uh, desire to maintain their standards. And I don't have an answer for how to handle that issue. But the reality is UP is not a school for the underserved because they cannot qualify if those board exams will remain there. So what we thought was a better solution rather than providing scholarships to a lot of kids who end up being not needful of scholarships anyway, was this voucher system, which worked very well for senior high school. Remember when senior high school was introduced, um, there were not enough senior high schools. All of a sudden you had one year and then the second year of senior high school and it was done almost overnight. 
On the other hand, the private schools all of a sudden were not going to get freshmen coming in because they were entering to grade 11 and grade 12 instead of going to freshman year. So bring the two together. <laughs> the private schools with excess classrooms and teachers, the, the public schools who are in need of, of, senior, of senior high school classrooms and teachers. And brilliantly, I think, the Department of Education under Brother Armin, I understand the undersecretary then named Francis Varela, I don't know if you remember him, who died in a motor accident, mm -hmm. unfortunately, was the, I, was the person who came up with the idea. Why don't we issue vouchers so that the kids can go to private schools and use this as a means of paying? And hopefully, uh, the vouchers were set at the level that were reasonable enough so that many private schools did not have to top up. We took that as the full tuition payment. All of our senior high schools accept the vouchers as full payment. And so ma in many of the places where we are, we are the largest senior high school, depending on vouchers from government. Now that system would have been much more sense, I think, because you can direct it to the participants in the PPPP um, the program. Uh, in other words, concentrate giving those vouchers really to the poorest of the poor and give the kids the opportunity to choose which school to go to. Maybe they'll want to go to FIMA schools rather than the, 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 the uh, public, uh, the government school in their community. Maybe the government school in the community is there, but it's not particularly good quality. Maybe the board passing rates of the public schools are not as the parents of the kids would want it to be. So I think a voucher system, and I hope that that's the direction that the Education Commission will be moving towards. So you're proposing we walk back from the free tuition well, bill and I go don't for know, the voucher system? Obviously, politically, that will be quite difficult. So I don't know how they will do it. Maybe they have to continue supporting those who are already enjoying it. But maybe for the freshmen, they should move towards a, towards a voucher system and gradually work that into the system. But there are better ways of doing it because really it's not reaching the poorest of the poor. And you are wasting resources on people who don't need that kind of support. There is that culture of college <coughs> going here in the Philippines that everybody has to go to college to be seen as fully educated. It, it seems to come at the expense of the technical, professional, and vocational education courses, the tech folk that you mentioned. What would you recommend would be a, a good solution for that, given that it may be a cultural issue to begin with? Yeah. Try to change mindsets. Well, first, let me, let me affirm your, your statement that there is a desire among the poor families, for example, one of their dreams is to have at least one of their kids have a college degree because they see a college degree as the path out of poverty, not only for the kid, but for the whole family. Uh, and so they, they sacrifice anything, including some of their daily meals so that they can afford tuition. And that's one of our motivations for saying, my gosh, so many of these families sacrifice so much. And then the quality of the education that their kids get is almost worthless because they are um, delivered by a lot of educational institutions that do not care about the real quality of the education that they're imparting on the kids. So that's one of the things that we took upon ourselves as a responsibility to at least fill in that gap and fill it. Now, going back to the question of why is a diploma still so important? That's a cultural thing and I, I, I agree. But I think we can do a lot to strengthen uh, the, the, the vocational courses. There are models, as you know, in Europe, for example, in Germany and in m many parts of Europe, where <coughs> you go through an internship process uh, and uh, apprenticeship and uh, the status of uh, craftsmen and people who are really trained in vocational activities is uh, acknowledged by, by society. So I think we've got work to do in terms of um, changing the mindset. But I think it's happening to a certain extent because the demand for carpenters, for plumbers, etc., is so high and their pay levels are getting, getting higher. Uh, but still, uh, we, we, we have work to do. And I think better coordination between TESDA and CHED would work towards blending the possibility of taking maybe vocational courses, but maybe blending it with enough uh, foundational college courses so that if they decide as they move on that they still want a college degree, they can do that. But if they want to work, then maybe they can go straight to work and not worry about the college degree. That kind of blending might be, might be something that needs to be worked on. And again, 
I'm hoping that the Education Commission will address that issue. We have had conversations with the legislators about this issue. By the way, uh, just, just to make a point, um, PBED has been very successful in getting the ears of the congressional leaders, guys like Mark Go and Kiko Benitez in the lower house, and Senator Gwyn Gachalian in particular, and people like uh, Senator Sani Angara and uh, Pia Cayetano, um, are very open to accepting our invitations for dialogues, and we've had quite a number of dialogues with them. Uh, and it's through these dialogues that we exchange views, etc., in an atmosphere of, uh, I guess, respect for each other. Uh, and that has been very fruitful, and it, that's, that's the venue where we take up a lot of these issues. But you've still got those silos to, to deal with as a challenge. Ah, yes. You've made ah, a yes. mention ah, yes. of, ah, yes. of the different silos within the education ecosystem. Yeah. As a corporate citizen and one that is involved in both uh, the business of education and the advocacy of education, what are you doing to break down those silos? <laughs> we, try, we try our best to get them to coordinate with each other. We promote activities where they can talk to each other, you know. One of the activities of PBED is uh, a summit where we bring together education people. Uh, but it's not just, um, it's, it's um, educators, businessmen, and uh, government people. And, the gov and, and in the education sector, we bring in uh, um, those from public schools and private schools. And the first time we did this several years ago, a lot of them were very pleased with the result because they said that it was the first time ever that they had ever talked to each other seriously in such a venue. So that was a revelation to us. And it turned out to be very, it's in fact supported by USAID because they see the value of it. They even say that in other countries, this is not happening. So this is one very important step. Just by starting to talk to each other, hopefully you will break down those silos. Uh, and the leaders of the organization, the ch chairman always comes. Popoy De Vera has been very good about it. In the DepEd, it's oftentimes at the level of USAC, which is okay. Uh, and TESTA occasionally comes, sometimes it's, uh, again, their deputies. But it's the Ched the chairman who is very religious in coming. But I guess those dialogues are very important because even people who are at the operating school level talk to each other and learn from each other and what are the concerns and what are the issues and what are the things we can collaborate and collaborate on and work together. So it's a process of, um, I guess, addressing the issue little by little, uh, but getting people to talk to each other is a major first step. <laughs> Before we go, just some quick answers for quick questions. What's the one thing you'd advise learners, young and old? that they should take schooling very seriously because um, the idea that education is the pathway to a better life is true. I mean, to the extent that you can take advantage of education opportunities made available to you, grab everything you can and take full advantage of it and learn as much as you can. Yeah. And what about those wanting to stay relevant in their work journeys? What should they do? Stay relevant, stay engaged with what's happening in society. I think don't be a, don't be a, don't be a bystander. Uh, I, I always believe that citizens, regardless of their station in life, whether you're a student, you're a professional, you're a CEO, whether you're a priest, whether you're a layman, etc., you must, you must care. You must, you must be concerned. And I am a big believer in the fact that um, our, our, our society will improve only by citizens doing what each one can do to improve society. Let's not let's get out of that mode of thinking that it's up to our politicians, it's up to our leaders to get our country out of this mess. No, it's up to each one of us doing our part. So what about those wanting to find an advocacy to pursue? Do they go grab it or does it just roll in and they just engage? Well, I believe in rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but I think, to be fair, choose what you really believe in and either be a leader or join groups who, who are pushing that advocacy. Uh, but the important thing is believe in it and, and believe that you can make a difference. No matter that you are alone, join groups and, uh, and participate and do your part. And I think uh, with more and more of us doing that, I think we're hopefully moving forward as a country. And it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Ramon. Wonderful, Looks like Kathy, you're just getting started as you with know, education. <laughs> as you can tell, I am passionate about education yes, and are. I can talk all night about it. Yes, indeed. But thank, thank you so you much so for much. the opportunity. It's good to see you. I appreciate it. You too, Ramon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
And catch us again next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Philippine Standard Time on One News. You can also check out The Long Conversation on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. I'm Kathy Yang, and this is Thought Leaders.